Now, friends, as we come to this 20th chapter of Revelation, we're dealing with the millennium in relationship to Christ, to Satan, to man, and to the tribulation saints, to the resurrections, to the earth, and to the great white throne. And we need to recognize that, unfortunately, a great many men in the past, including the late Dr. B.B. Warfield, one of the greatest minds that the church has ever had. He thought chapter 20 just wasn't worth considering because of the fact that the millennium was only mentioned there and the thousand-year period, and since it was just mentioned there, he didn't feel like that it was very important, and he just practically dismissed it altogether. Unfortunately, it's true that the millennium is mentioned only in this chapter. And when somebody says, but it's mentioned, it's a thousand years. Well, now let's not deal with semantics. Millennium comes from the Latin word that means 1,000. And so let's don't argue about semantics. Millennium means a thousand years. Any way you slice it, you come up with the same thing because it's 1,000 years. You could call a person a Chileus who believes in the millennium. And Chileism was the way the early church spoke of it because Chileism in Greek means a 1,000 also. So I hope we all understand we're talking about the same thing. And as a result, there have arisen three very definite schools in the area of the interpretation of the 20th chapter. I've referred to this before. I come back to it. The first school is postmillennialism. It assumed that Christ would come at the conclusion of the thousand years. In other words, man would bring in the kingdom by the preaching of the gospel. Now, this was an optimistic view which prevailed at the turn of the century. At that time, it looked like there might be a great worldwide turning to Christ, and the world would be converted. But that viewpoint has become obsolete. It could not weather the first half of the 20th century, which produced two world wars, a global depression, the rise of communism, and the atom bomb with which worldwide destruction is imminent. Therefore, postmillennialism is as dead as a dodo bird. Now, the other view, another view, I should say, is amillennialism. And a ah, in the Greek, it means you don't believe in a millennium. And it has become popular really only in recent years, as it largely has supplanted postmillennialism. It holds out no false optimism, and it has, for the most part, emphasized the coming of Christ. Now, its chief weakness is that it spiritualizes the thousand years, as it does all the book of Revelation. It fits the millennium into the present age. In fact, Dr. Warfield's interpretation that the millennium was going on in heaven while the tribulation is going on down here on the earth. My friend, that is something, I tell you. And I think that in heaven, they've got a millennium going not just for a thousand years, but from eternity to eternity. I never could see that, but nevertheless, that is a viewpoint. And it fits the millennium into the present age. That's where most of the amillennialists are. And all of the events recorded in Revelation are fitted into the facts of history, like pieces are fitted into a crazy quilt. And frankly, I think the results are just about the same. You come up with a crazy quilt. Now, premillennialism, on the contrary, takes Revelation 20 at face value, as it does all the book of Revelation, applying the literalist interpretation unless the context instructs otherwise. Now, we had an example of that back in chapter 19, where it says that out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus, when he comes, goes a sharp two-edged sword. Well, I've been asked, you mean the literal sword goes out of his mouth? Well, I think the Scripture makes it very clear that the Word of God is the sword. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Paul says. Now, with that kind of instruction, I don't see how we could misunderstand what he's talking about. But you do have to have a scriptural reason for your interpretation. 
And I don't think you can just spiritualize on any basis whatsoever. And, of course, that is the present custom today, and it's the popular method. Now, let us say, and I think it's obvious, that I am premillennial, and I'm also pre-tribulation, as you can see. And the reason is, I think that's what John is teaching here. And if you disagree with me, you and I can still be friends. If you want to be wrong, well, that's your business, not mine. So let's not get angry and heated and argue about this. Let's just each one of us state our position, and each one of us will think the other's wrong, of course. Now, let me read something here that I have written that I feel is rather important. It says, first of all, there can be no millennium until Satan is removed from the earthly scene. I think that's obvious. You couldn't have an ideal state down here as long as Satan is running loose. Now, in the second place, the curse of sin must be removed from the physical earth before a millennium can be established. The deserts to blossom is the rose. Well, I live here in California, and if you live along the coast in California, the desert blossoms like the rose. But none of us talk about eastern California. That is, we don't like to talk about it because it's a desert and it's not blossoming as the rose, I can assure you. Now, in the third place, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints must take place at the beginning of the thousand years. Daniel, I think, made that very clear in the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, that after the tribulation... You see, they're not raised before the great tribulation. They'd have to stand around and wait for the millennium. So there's no need for them to do that. So the Lord's not going to raise them until the tribulation is over. And we're told that in Daniel 12:1. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Now, this is Israel we're talking about. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So that you have here the great tribulation period, then the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. And also... We have the resurrection of the tribulation saints. They are to be raised. We'll see that as we go in here. And actually, only Christ can raise the dead. So he must come for that purpose. Now, in the fourth place, the tribulation saints are included in the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. Now, we'll get to that. And they reign with Christ during the millennium. Now, finally, the millennium is the final testing of man under ideal conditions. And this is the answer to those who say that there's nothing wrong in man which circumstances and conditions cannot change. Man is an incurable, an incorrigible sinner. Even at the end of the millennium, he's still in rebellion against God. And the rebellion in the human heart and the depraved nature of man is impossible for any man today to comprehend. You and I do not realize what terrible sinners we are. You know, if you and I could see ourselves as God sees us, we couldn't stand ourselves. Well, we think we're pretty good, don't we? And that we are very nice people. I guess some of us are. Now, the millennium is the final testing of mankind before the beginning of the eternal state. Now, the millennium is God's answer to the prayer, Thy kingdom come. When you pray the so-called Lord's Prayer, of course, a prayer which he never prayed, because it says, Forgive us our trespasses. He never prayed that prayer, I can assure you. That prayer says, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom that he's going to establish here on earth. It's called the millennium. And this is the kingdom that was promised to David. God took an oath relative to its establishment. And I have all these Scripture references in my book, and I'm not going to give them at this time. This is the kingdom predicted in the Psalms and in the prophets. All of the prophets spoke of this kingdom. Not a one of them missed it. The minor prophets as well as the major prophets. 
These are but a few of the manifold scriptures that we could bring forth to give. Actually, the theocratic kingdom was the great theme of all of the prophets in the Old Testament. This is the kingdom, the theocratic kingdom that's coming here upon this earth. Now, here in six verses, we have had given to us, actually, we have three more verses coming up, seven through nine. And in nine verses, we have had the word thousand years repeated six times. Now, it must be pretty important to put that kind of emphasis upon it. And therefore, let me say that the early church believed in what was known as Chileism. That was the teaching of the early church. And those that rejected it were considered actually in a state of heresy because the early church believed in a literal thousand years. And Chileism means that. Now, there came in later on the teaching that the thousand years would be established by the church. The church would produce a perfect world, and then Jesus would come and find everything in apple pie order. But that's just not the way this section presents it, you see. He's coming in judgment. And if everything was in apple pie order, then there would be no need to put down rebellion and judge and make war. Uh, He'd certainly be an intruder if he did that, if everything was good. But somebody says, you don't mean to tell me there was a time when man actually believed that the church was going to build the kingdom down here on this earth. Yes, my friend, it hasn't been too long ago to tell the truth. But back in 1883, a commentator, Justin A. Smith, and I have his commentary, he made this statement. But upon the other hand, what a tremendous force is the Christianity of today when all is said. Is it conceivable that this auspicious power which is so rapidly taking possession of the wide earth, can dwindle into that imbecility which some millenarians appear to predict for it. You see, back in 1883, this was said. And those of us that are premillennialists today, we would be called a bunch of pessimists, that we predicting that the world is going to get worse, there's going to be apostasy in the church. Why, they didn't believe that. Listen to what he said. It has been said that in 25 years more, if the present rate of progress continues, India will become as thoroughly Christian as Great Britain is today. But look at Great Britain today. It's as bad off as India is. Now, there will be 30 millions of Christians in China, and Japan will be as fully Christianized as America is now. The old systems, they tell us, are honeycomb through and through by Christian influence. It looks as if a day may soon come when these systems, struck by vigorous blows, will fall in tremendous collapse. Meantime, every weapon formed against Christianity breaks in the hand that holds it. Already the Lord's right hand hath gotten him victory. Oh, boy, did they talk brave in those days. They don't talk that way today. And Naville, in his book, The Problem of Evil, made this statement. The civilization of Europe, or to call it by its true name, which it derives from its origin, the Christian civilization is visibly making the conquest of the world. Its triumph is only a matter of time. No one doubts it. Well, brother, there are quite a few that doubt it today. In fact, The so-called European civilization, our Christian civilization, is going down the drink and has largely disappeared already. Now, these folk, they belittled this 20th chapter of Revelation. And even a man as great as Dr. Warfield, and you must understand, I was brought up under his system, and I respect him a great deal. I consider him the greatest scholar, probably, that this generation has produced, that is, this century, I should probably say. And he says that there's no reference to such an age as a millennium here on this earth, save in, these are his words, 
so obscure a portion as Revelation 20. May I say to you, he pays no attention to all of the Old Testament where God made a covenant that he would establish this kingdom on the earth and it would be one in David's line. He totally ignored that. And a man like Dr. Roth years ago said, our key does not open. The right key is lost. Until we are put in possession of it again, our exposition will never succeed. The system of biblical ideas is not that of our school at all. And I was educated in the South, and another honored theologian of the South of the past, Dr. R. L. Dabney, said, in speaking with a student who had got a hold of a premillennial book, he was so enthusiastic about it that he talked to Dr. Dabney and told him about it. And Dr. Dabney, the great scholar that he was, said, probably you were right. I never looked into the subject. Very frankly admit, he was honestly admitting that he just never studied prophecy. And the late Dr. Charles Hodge, who wrote a ponderous tome, in fact, two of them, on theology, and that's the theology I studied in school. But he very frankly said that eschatology just wasn't his bag. Only he didn't use that expression. He used a different one. Let me read and quote from him. The subject cannot be adequately discussed without taking a survey of all the prophetic teaching of the Scriptures, both of the Old Testament and the New. This task cannot be satisfactorily accomplished by anyone who has not made the study of the prophecies a specialty. The author, now this is Dr. Hodge, knowing that he has no such qualifications for the work, proposes to confine himself in a great measure to a historical survey of the different schemes of interpreting the scriptural prophecies relating to the subject. Now, today... All of that's changed. There's a lively interest today in prophecy. But I wish there were more that were as honest that Dr. Hodge is and say, well, I haven't really studied this subject as I should have. And unfortunately, a great many men are speaking on the subject of prophecy that have not actually studied this subject. This is a very important subject and a vital subject. And may I say to you, I don't claim to have any special qualification at all for it. I have studied it for 40 years, and I have given a great deal of attention to it. I was asked one time when I was pastoring downtown Los Angeles why I spoke so much on prophecy. Well, I said everybody else is ignoring it, and that was several years ago now. And I'm trying to make up for all of them. And I'm trying to put a great emphasis on it because I have always considered it important. But I think it's dangerous today that many are edging up to this matter of setting dates for the rapture of the church. And I don't think you can do that. I think that that is absolutely a dateless time. It may be tomorrow, but it may not be tomorrow. And it may not is just about as certain as it may. And so we need to recognize that we're in a period where we're not given dates, but we are seeing the setting of a stage. And I do not know what God has in mind for the future, but I do know that he sure has things in position. And I can say again with Dr. Bill Anderson, I sure wish the Lord, now that he's got things in position, would come on because I'd hate for him to have to go to all the trouble to get it back in position again. Well, I don't know that he will. Now I'm going to read this section because, very frankly, this matter of, as it was in the early church, Achilleism, is millenarianism today. And you're either pre or post or amillennial, as we have said. This is actually the great dividing line today among Bible expositors. There's no question about that. But it ought not to make us ugly with each other and call each other names and that sort of thing. If you disagree with me and accept one of these other positions, you're in good company. Some of the finest men I've known hold a different viewpoint than I do. But now, of course, if you want to be right, you'd want to go along with me, I'm sure. Now, let's come to the text. 
And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the abyss, and locked and sealed it over, that he should deceive the nations no longer, until the thousand years should be finished. After that, he must be loose for a little time. Now, you'll notice that the thousand years is mentioned two times in verses 1 through 3. Actually, it's mentioned six times in the 20th chapter. There are those that like to say, well, after all, the millennium is only mentioned in one chapter. Yes, but God mentioned it six times. How many times does he have to say a thing before it becomes true? He mentions it more than he mentions some other things that people emphasize today and think are important just because they occur once or twice in Scripture. Here, six times the thousand years is mentioned and always in relationship. And here, it's in relationship to the devil and Satan. We don't misunderstand who he is. And he's put in the abyss, and I've dealt with that before. There are some expositors that separate this section from the millennium. That is, the classifying it as the closing scene of the day of wrath. Now, this view takes the edge from the sharp distinction that there will be on earth at the removal of Satan, you see, the difference it makes. His incarceration and total absence from the earth changes conditions from darkness to light. He's the God of this age. He's the prince of the power of the air. And his power and influence in the world is enormous. It's beyond the computing of any IBM machine. His withdrawal makes way for the millennium. And with him loose, there could be no millennium. So you see, we see the millennium in relation to Satan. He has to be removed from the earth scene. Men talk about bringing peace on this earth and about producing prosperity and all that sort of thing, and it'll finally be headed up in the Antichrist, and he'll not be able actually to accomplish that, although for a while it will look as if he's going to do it. But you see, long as Satan is abroad in this world, you can't have a utopia down here. You can't have an ideal situation with him loose. And Satan's power is reduced here for an ordinary angel, becomes his jailer, and leads him away captive. Now, the abyss is a better description of the prison than is the bottomless pit. In either case, it's not the lake of fire. We're going to talk about that a little later now. After that, he must be loosed for a little time. Now, here's where I have a problem. And I mean a real problem. Why is he loosed after God got him in the abyss and chained? And I never shall forget the answer that the late Dr. Louis Perry Chafer gave when he was asked why God loosed Satan after he once had him bound. And his reply, I think, is significant. He says, if you tell me why God let him loose in the first place, I'll tell you why God let him loose in the second place. Well, that's the answer. Why did God let him loose? Well, God's got a great purpose back of it. And it is that great problem of evil. Why has God permitted it? And I believe that God is working out a tremendous program. And that's the mystery of God that is yet to be revealed to us. And it is going to be revealed someday. And all that he's asking me to do, and you for that matter, is to walk by faith. Will you trust God that he's doing all right? I remember my dad took me with him one time in a trip, and we were in a buggy. He had a buggy and a horse, and a storm came up. It was out in West Texas, and I just, a boy, and I want to tell you, I was frightened. The wind was blowing. It was a real storm, and we were getting wet. And I never shall forget, my dad put his arm around me, and he said, Son, you just trust me. (laughs) And I did. I just snuggled right up to him, and trusted him, and we got through the storm. My earthly father, he's gone. Died when I was 14. I haven't had an earthly father 
very long. But I've had a heavenly father now for a great many years. And so through the storms of life and all these problems that come up, I don't know why. I wish I had the answer to give you, but I don't. And I read a book the other day. The title was interesting, The Problem of Evil. Well, when I finished the book, we still had the problem of evil. It didn't solve it. I can assure you that. And that fellow took him about 200 pages to say what I can say in just one sentence. I don't know the answer to the problem of evil. He didn't either. May I say to you, we're going to get the answer someday. And we'll walk by faith. Now, God has him incarcerated for a thousand years because you couldn't have a millennium without that. Now, we have the saints of the great tribulation reign with Christ a thousand years. And I'm going to read from my translation again. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And whosoever worshiped not the wild beast, neither his image, and received not the mark upon their forehead or upon their hand, and they lived again. Now, you see, they're raised from the dead. These are tribulation saints. Many are going to die for Christ in that period. They lived again and reigned with Christ 1,000 years. So the tribulation saints are going to trade in three and a half years for a 1,000 years. And I would say they're getting a pretty good deal, if you ask me. But that three and a half years was rugged and terrible. Now, let me continue to read. This is the first resurrection. In case you think that this is not the resurrection of the saved, he'd have you know that the first resurrection includes the church. Actually, I should go back and say Christ is the first fruits. Then the church is raised. Then the Old Testament saints, and then the tribulation saints. And all of these constitute the first resurrection. And that's the resurrection of the saved. Now, the resurrection of the lost is a separate resurrection altogether. And we're going to see that when we get to it. Again, may I say that this is a rather naive notion that somehow or another way the world's going to end, why Jesus will come and it's a simple thing and the dead are raised and he puts the good guys on one side, the bad guys on the other, and then they move into eternity, and that's it. My friend, God has a program, and he follows a very definite program. He always has in the past, and he moves intelligently. Now, let me continue to read. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death hath no authority, any power, but they shall be priests of God and of the Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, for just a moment, let's look at this. This prophecy is like any other prophecy in Scripture. As Peter put it in 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That is, you can't just lift out a verse of Scripture and base a doctrine on that. You need to have the corroboration of other scriptures. And when this passage here is treated as a dignified statement of literal facts, it becomes reasonable and it fits into the entire program of prophecy that we've been following. Now, any attempt to reduce it to the lowest common denominator of fanciful and figurative symbols makes the passage an absurdity. Of course it does. And to spiritualize this passage is to disembowel all Scripture of vital meaning, making the interpretation of Scripture a reducto ad absurdum. Now, that is what I've written in my book. Now, the thrones are literal. The martyrs here are literal. Jesus is literal. And the Word of God is literal, and the beast is literal, and the image here is literal, and the mark of the beast is literal, and their foreheads and their hands are literal, and the thousand years are literal. It's all literal. And the thousand years 
means a thousand years. Now, if God meant that it was eternal, I think he would have said so. If he meant it was 500 years, he would have said so. Can't God say what he means? Of course he can. And when he says a thousand years, he means a thousand years. Now, the word for resurrection here is interesting. It's the same word Paul used in 1 Corinthians 15 for the resurrection of Christ and believers, anastasia. And it means a bodily resurrection. Now, he says here, I saw thrones and they sat on them. Now, they here, it causes some question. I grant that. Who's they? Well, I come to the conclusion, and it's just my judgment now here, they must be the total number of those who have been part in the first resurrection. And that includes the church began with Christ. Well, let me go over this again. The first resurrection began with the resurrection of Christ. Then it's followed by the resurrection of his church. And that's 1,900 years later, 1,900 plus. I don't know how much more. But before the Great Tribulation, as we've seen in Revelation 4. Now, at the end of the Great Tribulation is the resurrection of both the tribulation saints, the souls of them that had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the Word of God, and whoever worshiped the beast, and so on. And the Old Testament saints, as we saw in Daniel 12, 1. And I have a diagram that I put in my book on Revelation, and I took it from my book on the Rose Parade of Resurrection, that God is following a program. This is not some little naive notion. This is a program that God is following and that he's given in his word. I hope you have that chart. You can get it in either one of my books, the second volume of Revelation. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. Now, the tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints will evidently reign on this earth with Christ. And I think David will be his vice jura. Now, the church, which is the bride of Christ, will reside in the new Jerusalem, where she reigns with him from that exalted place. And I think over a great deal of God's creation. We'll see that in the next chapter. Christ will commute back and forth from the new Jerusalem to the old Jerusalem on this earth. In fact, there must be a great deal of traffic as the church travels back and forth between its heavenly home and the earth. Multitudes of both Israel and the Gentiles, they will enter the kingdom in natural bodies, not having died. And these are the ones, together with those that are born during the millennium, these are the ones who are tested during this period. And as Christ in a glorified body mingled with his apostles and followers, so the church in the glorified bodies will mingle with the multitudes in their natural bodies here on the earth. And the church and glorified bodies will be able to move out into space. That's the first time I'm going to take any space travel. I'll tell you that. I want to make sure that gravitation doesn't grab me with a seat of the pants and pull me back to this earth in a hurry. And it won't in that day. Now, we are told they shall be priests unto God. Now, that refers unto the entire nation of Israel. And this is God's original purpose for Israel. For he said in Exodus 19:6, "...ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel." Abraham was a priest in his family. Levi was the priestly tribe with the family of Aaron serving as high priest. And in the theocratic kingdom here on this earth, the entire nation of Israel will be priests. Now, in Scripture, there is more prophecy concerning the millennium than of any other period. The kingdom was the theme of the Old Testament prophets. And I don't know how else you'd interpret it. That's the reason that we've had hundreds, well, I'd say thousands of letters of people saying they never studied the minor prophets before, never heard a message from the minor prophets. Why that great silence today? Why that vacuum and void? Well, because somebody's forgetting about the millennium that's going to be established here on this earth because all of them 
look forward to that kingdom that's coming on the earth. And here it is. Now, let me read again, beginning verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, now apparently they're coming to an end, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, shall come forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the war, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up over the breadth of the earth, compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down out of heaven and devoured them, just as Sodom and Gomorrah went up in the smoke. Now, the entire book of Revelation deals with last things, especially do these last few chapters. Here is the last rebellion of Satan and man against God. The millennium, you see, is a time of testing of man under ideal conditions. And as this passage demonstrates, now as soon as Satan is released, a great company who have been under the personal reign of Christ under ideal circumstances goes over to him. From where did such a company come? And that's a good question. The answer lies in the fact that not only do multitudes enter the millennium, but multitudes are born during the millennium. Isaiah 11, 6, 65, 20. I don't have time to turn to those passages. Now, this will be the time of the earth's greatest population explosion. Disease will be eliminated, the curse of sin removed from the physical earth, and it will produce enough food stuff to feed its greatest population. And the human heart alone remains unchanged under these circumstances, and many will still turn their back on God and will go after Satan. It seems unbelievable, you say. Well, what about today? The Satan's doing pretty well in our day. Now, we explain this rebellion after the millennium as revealing how terrible the heart of man is. And you remember Jeremiah said, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And you and I do not really know how vile we really are and how separated we are and that we have an old nature. And that old nature, you just can't bring it into subjection to God at all. The carnal mind, Paul said in Romans 8, 7, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, these are folk that have lived under ideal conditions with Christ reigning. And I think they got a little tired of it, very frankly. I think when he reigns, as we've said, he's really going to be a dictator. You're going to stay in line or else. And they didn't like staying in line. And therefore, when the opportunity was offered to them to rebel, why, they rebelled. And it reveals the power of Satan. And there followed them. Now, the rebellion is labeled Gog and Magog. Now, many Bible students identify it with the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, very candidly, I think this is just due to the fact that the names are the same. But this is not possible at all, for the conditions described are not parallel as to time, as to place, or participants. Only the name is the same. The invasion from the north by Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 breaks the false peace of the Antichrist and causes him to show his hand in the midst of the Great Tribulation. Now, that rebellion of the godless forces from the north will have made such an impression on mankind that after 1,000 years, the last rebellion of man bears the same label. In other words, that began Armageddon, really. It was a war, not just a single battle. Now, we have passed, I think, through a similar situation in this century. World War I was so devastating that when war broke out in Europe again, and included many of the same nations and even more, it was labeled again World War. It was the same name, but it was differentiated by the number two. World War I, World War II. And now you hear people today predicting World War III. And the Scripture says it's coming. 
on this earth. Now, the war in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is Gog and Magog, number one. And the reference here in verse 8 is to Gog and Magog, number two. Just because the names are the same, this is a different war. This is the last rebellion of Satan. And I'm sure that just because they bear the same name it does not mean that they are the same. In my family, there were so many Johns on both sides of the family that my mother decided that I should be J. Vernon McGee. The J, many people ask, which stands for John. And I never was called John because there were too many Johns around. <laughs> that doesn't sound good, but that's exactly what it was. And so I was named J. Vernon. Now, just because we had similarity in names doesn't mean we're the same person. I had an uncle on one side, an uncle named John. I had a grandfather named John. In fact, two grandfathers named John. And my dad's name was John. So you can understand why I bear that name of J. Vernon. It had to be separated from that crowd. Now, we have here in verse 9 the dropping of the last atomic bomb. The phrase here, from God, is actually not in the best text. It simply means that natural forces which destroyed Gog and Magog number one, and if you'll check back with it, you'll see that it was natural forces, it will destroy Gog and Magog number two. You can check. Actually, there were certain plagues that God brought on them. There was the rain of hailstones from heaven. Now, this last rebellion and resistance against God was as foolish and futile as man's first rebellion in the Garden of Eden. Here, it is not the beginning but the ending of man's disobedience to God. It is the finality of man's rebellion Nothing remains now but the final judgment. And so we have here in verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where are also the wild beast and the false prophet, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, this is a most solemn statement. And it's rejected by this lovey-dovey age in which we live today. But it is a relief to God's child to know that the enemy, both his and God's, will at last be brought to permanent justice. There is nothing here to satisfy the curiosity or the sadistic taste. The fact is stated in reverent reticence, which to me is awe-inspiring. If man had written this... Having said this much, he couldn't have restrained himself from saying more. Because today, all of these things that Sir Robert Anderson called the wild utterances of prophecy mongers. You see, men today, they go farther than the Word of God. The Word of God is very restrained. Very little is said about this subject of hell and actually of heaven. But we're going to see heaven next time. Now, there are several facts here that contradict popular notions. First of all, the devil is not in hell today. He is the prince of the power of the air. He today is the one that controls this world to a large extent in which we live. God has limited him, of course, today in the Great Tribulation. He'll have full reign for a while. Now, in the second place... Here, he's not the first to be cast into hell. We saw the wild beast and the false prophet preceded him by 1,000 years. And then finally, hell is described as a lake of fire and brimstone. Now, the Lord Jesus is the one who gave the most solemn description of hell. Will you listen to these verses? Luke 3, 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. Now, this is, of course, John the Baptist. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then Matthew eight twelve. 
but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, it ought to make anyone stop and think. How can it be utter darkness and still be a literal fire? For you read in Matthew thirteen forty-two, and he shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then again, the Lord Jesus in Mark nine forty-four, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, to me, that fire is a picture, and it is the best symbol that could be used of the reality. Sins that men have committed in the spirit, for instance, how are they to be punished in the body? I think that outer darkness is to be separated from God and to look back upon a life that's been misspent in this world. And can you think of any fire that would be hotter? Then for a man to be in hell and to hear the voice of a son of his say, Dad, I followed you down here. I want to say to you today, this is a solemn thing. A man said to Dr. Bill Anderson, he says, Suppose that we get over there and find out that this is not true at all. Well, Dr. Anderson said, Then I will just have to apologize and say I must have misunderstood the Lord. But he says to the man, suppose we get over there and I'm right and you're wrong. What about it then? May I say to you, friends, that's the thing that has kept a great many men sleepless at night. What about it if this is true? And friends, it is true. This is the Word of God that we're looking at. We love John 3.16, but what do you think about this? I think that Fire is a very poor symbol of the reality of what it means to be lost, separated from God for eternity. Now, you can't reduce these descriptions to something less than the reality. And I would not accept anything less, because always a symbol is a poor representative of the reality. And you can't dissolve this into the thin air of make-believe. The reality far exceeds the description, and human language is beggarly in trying to depict the awful reality. Hell is a place. It's also a state. It is a place of conscious torment. Now, that is the language of the Word of God. You can't escape that. Now, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now, this is the great white throne. And this is what men mistakenly call the general judgment. But it's general only in the sense that all the lost of all ages are raised to be judged here. All the saved have been raised in the first resurrection. And that's made clear here, that even the tribulation saints have part in the first resurrection. This is the second resurrection. And these are raised here for judgment. The lost are raised to be given an equitable, fair, and just evaluation of their works in respect to their salvation. I said to a man on his deathbed right here in Pasadena years ago, I was asked by his wife to visit him, and he says, Preacher, you just don't need to talk to me about the future. I'll take my chances. I believe God is going to be just and righteous and let me present my works. And I said, You're right. He is just and righteous, and he's going to let you present your works. That's what he says he's going to do. But I says, I have news for you. At that judgment, nobody's saved because you can't be saved by your works. When you stand in the white presence of the righteousness of God, your little works will seem so puny that they don't amount to anything at all. My little grandson brought into his grandmother the other day some flowers that he'd picked. And I want to tell you, they were a sad-looking bunch of flowers. And with great pride, he gave them to his grandmother. And his grandmother patted him on the head and thanked him for the lovely flowers. And when I looked at that scene... I couldn't help but smile, but I also immediately recognized how solemn it's going to be when a lot of these goody-goody boys 
are going to stand in the presence of a Christ they've rejected with their little bitty bouquet and expect that he'll be a grandmother to pat you on the head and say, what a smart boy you were. My friend, this is solemn and this is serious. You need a Savior to stand into his presence. You need to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Don't you know we are sinners? We are lost. We're in a world of it. We like to compare ourselves with other people. I'm as uh, good as the Joneses down the street. Sure you are, but you ought to know about the Joneses. It was Samuel Johnson that said, Every man knows that of himself, which he dares not tell his best friend. You know yourself, don't you? You know things that you've covered up and smothered that you wouldn't have revealed for anything in the world. Well, the Lord Jesus is going to bring them out at this point. While you're presenting your little bouquet, he's going to tell you about yourself. You need a Savior today. Now, will you notice, this is the great white throne, and the holiness of this throne is revealed in the reaction of heaven and earth to it. They roll up as a scroll. The one sitting on the throne is the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how do you know? The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And he hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they'll come forth, they that have done good. Well, what is the work of God? To believe on him whom he has sent. Those are the ones that have done good. They've accepted Christ. And then they come forth unto the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. We've talked about that. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of what? Of damnation and condemnation. That's the great white throne judgment. Now, he says here, Verse 12 and 13, I saw the dead, great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Sure, you're going to be able to get a fair trial there, friends. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in him. And they were judged, every one according to their works. My friend, may I say to you, your life is on tape. And he happens to have the tape. And when he plays it back, you're going to be able to listen to it. And it's not going to sound good to you by any means. Are you willing to stand before God and have him to play the tape of your life. And also, I think he'll have it on television there for you so you can see it, too. And you think that your life can stand the test? I don't know about you, but I couldn't make it. Thank God for the grace of God. That's the only way. Now, John says here, the dead are classified as the small and the great. They're all lost, for evidently none have their names written in the book of life. They had never turned to God for salvation. And the Lord Jesus said that in his generation, ye will not come to me that you may have life. These had not come. And there are books which record the works of all individuals. God keeps the tapes, and he'll play them at the right time. And I want to tell you that there are a lot of politicians that are going to have their tapes played in that day. And there are going to be a lot of us preachers that will have our tapes played in that day. And I want to tell you, we're not going to be happy about it at all. But if you're saved, you don't go before this judgment. Your works are to be judged as a child of God at the judgment seat of Christ, which took place during the Great Tribulation. This is the judgment of the laws. The Lord Jesus said, You'll not come to me that you might have life. And these didn't come. And multitudes want to be judged according to their works. And this is their opportunity. The judgment is just, but no one is saved by works. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Multitudes have gone to a watery grave in which the chemicals of their bodies have been dissolved in the waters of the sea. And you say, how can it be raised? Because some of it's in the Atlantic and some's in the Pacific. 
Well, God will have no problem with that. After all, they're only atoms. He just has to put them back together. Again, he did it once. He can do it again. The graves on earth will give up their bodies. And Hades, the place where the spirits of the lost go, will disgorge for this judgment. And it's a frightful judgment. Now, I'm turning to the last of chapter 20 today. And I put in here and begin reading verses 14 and 15. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, even the lake of fire. And if any were not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Now, there are some things that need explanation there. The word here for hell, and I read in the translation, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire, and I changed it in my translation, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Well, that is an unfortunate translation in our Bible. Sheol in the Old Testament is not hell, nor is Hades in the New Testament. Actually, this place, it's the place of the unseen dead. It's divided into two compartments. The Lord Jesus in the parable of the poor man and the rich man who died, he divided it into paradise and the place of torment. Paradise was emptied when Christ took with him at his ascension the Old Testament believers. And if you turn over to the fourth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians and read, which I'll do, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto man. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, he did do two things. He gave gifts to man down here, but he also took with him to heaven the Old Testament saints that had died. That is, the place called paradise. But the place of torment will deliver up the loss for judgment at the great white throne, which we saw last time. All who stand at this judgment are lost, and we're told that they're cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. We're also told the Lord called it outer darkness. Now, we believe that that is symbolic of something worse than literal fire and outer darkness. I believe that it's much worse than that. It is eternal separation from God, for death means separation. Now, death, the great final enemy of man, is finally removed from the scene, and no longer will it be said, in Adam all die. And death is personified in this case because it's man's great enemy. The Old Testament said that, Hosea 13:14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I'll redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I'll be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. And that's in Hosea 13, verse 14. Then Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, said, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then in verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? In other words, Hades is the prison of lost souls, is likewise cast into the lake of fire. Why? Well, the lost are no longer in Hades, but are in the lake of fire. So this is where Satan, the wild beasts, and the false prophet and their minions were consigned. Now, let's face up to it. If man will not accept the life of God, he must accept the only other alternative. God never created man to be put in this place. But there's no other place for him. Eternal association with Satan, for that was the purpose of the creation of hell itself. 
And I take it it's a place where God never goes. He stays away. And it means to be separated from God. And the second death means eternal and absolute separation from God.